um, this webinar by basically asking a question to get to know the audience a little bit better. Um, so have you built or are you currently building a landing zone in your organization? I believe Christoph prepared a poll, so please shoot. I will also vote. I see votes coming in. Nice. We have right. about half, 60%. Yeah, I give this 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, here we go. Okay, that's an interesting result. Um, so 19% of you have built a landing zone, 3% um, of you are currently building a landing zone and then 78% haven't built a landing zone yet. That's great um, because we will elaborate a little bit on the basics, what the landing zone actually is. Um, and I believe we have the right audience for that. Um, let's continue. So first, what are landing zones? Uh, um, landing zones are kind of a universal concept of multi-projects and multi-account architectures that are basically being used in hyperscalers, uh, Google Cloud, AWS, Azure. And the way that I frame it is that they serve as a blueprint for cloud environments. Uh, there is no standard definition or no one size fits them all definition. Um, they're involving products. Every organization has kind of their own requirements and is looking at landing zones in a different way. Um, having that said, um, I think we can summarize some components that are used among most or all organizations, but then it pretty much depends whether you're a startup or an SMB or an enterprise and the complexity of your organization as you grow, the landing zone may evolve. Um, and they create an effective operational and governance model that basically help you drive your cloud adoption strategy and pretty much determine how teams will collaborate and ensure security controls as your organization basically grows. Yeah. What does it mean? That means the core value proposition is to basically abstract away complexity for teams and enable your engineering development teams to get started faster um, yeah, by basically securely enabling um, self-service. And we do this by yeah, building, um, enabling building blocks, implementing building blocks that um, have key compliance, security best practices, um, and opinionated defaults and best practices built in. Uh, some standards to follow um, available for uh, all major clouds are the Center of Internet Security benchmarks. Those, those are quite um, yeah, a good starting point when it comes to how to securely and uh, uh, yeah, how to securely configure basically and cloud yeah we have one question um maybe if i may interrupt so um do you mean multi-cloud or multi-project on one cloud platform um can be both yeah so you can basically the ways that we build landing zones that we have dedicated landing zones for each um cloud provider but all of the landing zone types that i've seen are multi-account which is aws centric right or multi-project, which is then Google Cloud-centric architectures. Uh, mm -hmm. But of course, um, as you go multi-cloud, um, you may federate identity providers among both clouds, right? Something like Okta or Active Directory or whatnot. Uh, of course, as you, if you want to, if you do multi-cloud, the complexity increases significantly. Which is, by the way, also one of the main um, main decision points. Or main main decision drivers for us um, to use Terraform as a technology technology as its cloud um, agnostic, right? Does that answer the question? I, I hope so. Go, go ahead. Okay. Um, back to the topic. So that means uh, landing zones basically enable teams to build a reliable and secure foundation that grow and enhance over time. Yeah, pre-configured. <clears throat> we already said this. Pre-configured uh, best practices. And um, you would most likely want to use infrastructure as code um, that is in line with security compliance best practices. And it should enable your teams on focus, yeah, basically on delivering applications and services that drive business value uh, instead of 
always thinking about how to, for example, create a new project in Google Cloud. Um, some benefits that we see when establishing and uh, building basically a lending zone, a um, faster delivery and self-service. With self-service, we basically mean um, provisioning and deploying projects, environments, and infrastructure um, as needed for workloads. And I will elaborate on this on um, yeah in a little bit later, where I will present to you an example resource hierarchy in Google Cloud. Um, more reliable workflows, yeah, as you build a so, um, solid foundation that is basically streamlining requirements throughout the software delivery process. Um, yeah, and teams can basically start work while having a foundational security and compliance in place. That's pretty, pretty important. So, for example, when you enable teams to self-service, create accounts in AWS or projects in Google Cloud, you really want to ensure that some settings are pre-configured. Um, maybe they may be customizable for certain teams or departments in your organization, but you basically want to abstract this complexity for the teams. Uh, and something that I really like talking about is enforce safe and appropriate least privileged access to services. Uh -huh. And this we basically do by implementing IAM through infrastructure as code and by using as little permissions as possible, uh, or for example, custom roles in, in, in Google Cloud. And another point um, that we see um, on the benefit sides is to reduce costs and managing them effectively. So for example, you can, or you may set budgets for specific departments in your Google Cloud organization, um, or essential contacts, for example, billing contacts, yeah, they get alerted whenever you reach a certain threshold. And um, one of the biggest um, upsides, especially in Google Cloud, is the centralization of network design and management. Um, so for example, in Google Cloud, and again, this is a rather Google Cloud-centric um, uh, topic. In, in AWS, it doesn't exist. Um, but in Google Cloud, we have shared VPC, which basically enables you to centralize network management. So basically managing one or multiple VPCs and subnets in a centralized or multiple centralized projects that you can make accessible for other projects. And the upside here is that instead of leaving the responsibility and ownership of managing networks, firewall rules, et cetera, to the different teams, you can have one centralized team that is doing this and basically implements and enforce best practices as you go. Um, the life cycle of a lending zone it's basically pretty much the same as developing a product or it's considered to be a product team. So what we see um, when organizations start adopting landing zones, it will most likely take you between three to six months with a three to five parks product team to develop an MVP. Yeah? And it's just due to this, due to the fact that landing zones are rather comprehensive. And quite often, there also needs to be a lot of alignment uh, um, done on the government side of things. Uh, so whenever building a landing zone, it's actually not that you build something and it's ready to ship and this is it, right? But you basically consider this to be a product that you elaborate on and you keep developing as your organization grows. Uh, so what technologies to use when building a landing zone and what cloud services to include? Uh, um, as said, we will heavily focus on Google Cloud here, um, not because we are a Google Cloud partner, but um, because we see that building on Google Cloud can be up to 60% faster just due to the yeah complexity overhead. They are very developer-centric cloud. It's great, pretty straightforward. Um, of course, um, they don't have all the services that AWS offer, but um, especially the services that we see most often, such as containers, yeah, GKE, et cetera, are great. Um, but then again, you may also end up in a multi-cloud environment, of course. Uh, this is just some personal learnings. Um, having worked on yeah, all three major clouds and yeah, basically from smaller to enterprise-grade kind of projects, my experience is that um, building on Google Cloud is the most straightforward and fasted, fastest. Um, but it also heavily depends on the requirements of your organization, of course. 
Also some questions um, yeah. about uh, Azure or expansion to other clouds, Alibaba, IBM cloud. What is the question? So how about Azure? Um, and and how about you know Alibaba, IBM cloud, other clouds? So you can, um, for example, of, of course you have the landing zone patterns in Azure. I have not yet worked with Alibaba. Um, or IBM Cloud. I did not, so um, I'm sure those patterns are transferable. I just don't know how the services compare. Mm -hmm. um, in Azure, as in every other major cloud, there are basically guidelines and well-architected frameworks issued by the different cloud providers that give you recommendations on at least how to implement an enterprise-grade um, kind of uh, landing zone. Yeah. The problem with those are basically that they give you an idea and some guidelines what to do in terms of like, hey, you should use those services. You should probably configure policy ABC, but they don't really give you guidelines on how to do this with infrastructure as code. Maybe to some extent, some have yeah open source um, packages that exist, but they really don't dive into how to enable developer self-service how to make this scalable yeah in a sense that if you manage hundreds or thousands of different um services in your in, a, in your landing zone how this actually scales from an infrastructure as code point of view etc so the guidelines exist but what i see is that a lot of organizations keep implementing landing zones over and over again which is actually the purpose of our company um so what, what we do is we basically at the moment, uh, we're developing a framework that that kind of simplifies this a lot. So instead of setting up the automation over and over again, configuring the base services, you can really focus on thinking about your governance and organizational requirements instead of yeah, building the underlying complexity or te technology. Yeah. Um, but again, um, I haven't really built um, landing mm -hmm. zones a part of an AWS and Google Cloud, so my knowledge is limited. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, back to the topic. Um, so what technologies to use? Um, infrastructure as code. Uh, um, I guess most of you guys will know what infrastructure as code is, but it basically enables you to build, change, and manage your infrastructure in a safe, consistent, and repeatable way um, by defining resource configuration, aka infrastructure, et cetera, that you can version, reuse, and share. Uh, in the different uh, different technologies out there, yeah, we have Terraform, Pulumi, CDK, Crossplane, whatnot. My personal belief is that on the rather ops centric side of the business, yeah, which a landing zone definitely is, Terraform is the leading tooling when it comes to how development teams and engineering teams deploy infrastructure. It heavily depends, and I see organizations moving to a heterogeneous approach. Yeah? So instead of just using Terraform for everything, you may use Terraform for your landing zone and then your data teams are using CDK or something else to deploy their, their services. So, and different technologies have different use cases and solve different problems. Um, so why ISC basically? Uh, um, I kind of reuse this slide every time I talk about infrastructure as code. Um, basically, Click ops uh, is slow. Um, you can't reuse or you cannot really reuse what you build. There's little to no knowledge transfer. Uh, you build isolated, isolated knowledge silos. No versioning, no audit trail, no rollbacks, no automation, and it's error prone, right? And um, you use this by yeah, using infrastructure as code that enables you to be pretty fast by basically having the CI execute whatever you do. Um, it's reusable, so you can isolate your infrastructure into modules that you enhance and reuse over time, uh, aka spinning up new environments. Um, the code itself is already documentation. Um, the code can be, um, we can use static code analysis for validation. We can anal analyze um, plans for security and threat analysis, cross predictions, etc. So it's pretty neat. Um, of course, you version it in, in Git, yeah, which is kind of a change history, and you can easily roll back, or you should easily be able to, to roll back changes. And yeah, what I already said, it's it, it makes basically your infrastructure environment more reliable. Um, what is Terraform? 
very quickly, most of you will notice. Um, Terraform is basically the leading tooling out there when it comes to infrastructure as code. Um, is maintained by HashiCorp, a great organization. And it's basically, um, yeah, it provides you with a declarative syntax and configuration files that um, enables you to build consistent workflows to provision and manage all of your infrastructure throughout the whole life cycle. Yeah? By the way, I didn't write this myself. I took this from the Terraform intro, yeah? just to make sure. Um, a tool that we will use in the demo um, is um, something that we recently released. Um, it's called Terramate. Um, Terramate is a pretty new open source tool that yeah, basically enables you to orchestrate and manage different stacks in your Terraform code. So it helps you splitting up Terraform uh, or Terraform state tiles into isolated stacks. And it also gives you the ability to basically use code generation. Um, before someone asks how this compares to TerraSpace or TerraGrant, other also really good tooling out there. Terramate is not a wrapper. Terramate is a code generator. That means you can use it to optimize how you're using Terraform basically, but you don't need to install it as a dependency in your EG um, CI pipelines, right? It generates native HCL and Terraform code that can be executed without installing dependencies. Now, we um, open sourced it half a year ago. It sees quite good adoption at the moment and pretty good community feedback. Maybe check it out, maybe it can help you. And we also provide some learning material on it. Again, it's open source, fully, fully free. Now, um, something that is essential um, for basically using automation in ISC, and I will demo this to you in a minute is basically um, to enable teams to review whatever they do in the pull request already. A very basic way of doing this would be to just yeah um, append a Terraform plan to your pull request in uh, 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 GitHub or I believe merge request in GitLab. And that already helps you a lot to understand what's actually happening instead of just looking at the code. You can, of course, drive this to another level by visualizing this with uh, diagrams. I believe there's some some uh, solutions providers out there. Uh, Brainboard is one of them, I believe. Um, haven't tried it, so can't comment on this, but um, should help you to visualize and easily understand whatever is happening. Um, something else that we want to consider when building a landing zone is self-service. Yeah? So the landing zone um, itself is a pattern that is most likely managed by a DevOps, a platform team, but we really want to enable engineering teams to create environments, projects, et cetera, as they go. Um, so they don't need to write a Jira ticket that gets considered six weeks later. And then we have this yeah, classical ops cycle of feedback loops. And then maybe two, three months later, this, this project finally gets created. And um, what we want to do is provide patterns that we can reuse and that we basically enable engineers um, yeah, to, to self-service deploy those um, basic patterns following best practices. So what components to consider when building a landing zone on Google Cloud? Uh, billing budgets um, are important. Then, of course, organizational structure, aka organizations, folders, and projects, and project liens. Project liens are basically um, deletion protections. They um, enable you to mark projects as not deletable. So no one can by accident, also not the CI, can by accident um, delete those. Uh, I've seen a lot of implementation where actually projects and liens are in the same stack. And then if you delete the stack with infrastructure as code, the uh, yeah, deletion protection will be deleted first and then the project will, will be deleted. So it doesn't really work out. Um, so just a, a small hint, it's important to basically move them into isolated stacks. And at this stage, I would just quickly like to refer to some example to an example um, architecture here in Google Cloud. Um, Christoph, is that visible? So, so not really. So, so, yeah, better, better, better. Okay, so um, what I basically said is that um, organization are kind of the, the highest level in the resource hierarchy in Google Cloud. And then we have folders. And then we have projects and projects basically um, bundle a bunch of resources 
um, and building together. Yeah? And then IAM can be applied on different levels. Organizational policies can be applied on different levels. But a pattern that we quite often use is to basically use folders <clears throat> to come up with the organizational hierarchy in, in the sense of departments and teams and projects itself we use for bundling environments, aka workload. So a workload in that sense could be a service that contains of different microservices that the backing infrastructure runs, for example, in the individual projects, but then the actual Kubernetes pods run in a shared cluster. And um, what's interesting to consider here is that on a project level, um, we quite often create and manage identity groups in Google or in the identity provider of choice. And that's because it's basically the recommended way of binding roles to um, groups instead of to individuals, right? It doesn't really scale. So let's assume you have a folder platform in your organization. So now very basic way of um, um, granting permissions would be to have groups for GCP platform admins, GCP platform developers, and GCP platform viewers that you pre-configure a different set of permissions. Uh, and then you could use even the, the GUIs uh, mechanisms of existing identity provider, providers, um, for example, Google Workspaces in terms of Google Cloud, um, Active Directory, um, Okta, whatnot, to manage members, memberships. Otherwise, if you man manage memberships in code, uh, you may end up having drifts all the time as um, the admins of your organization or an offboard people in the identity provider of choice. Okay, let's jump back to the presentation. Actually, I can also close this quickly. Um, access management, uh, create and manage identity groups. That's what I already mentioned. Um, and then I am uh, organizational, I am project specific custom roles and identity provider. We'll look at this at the demo. Just need to check the time. Okay, already 30 minutes in. Let's hurry up a little bit. Um, Networking, yeah, I mentioned it previously, shared VPC, firewall rules, firewall rules logging, VPC flow logging, then uh, CloudNAT, Cloud DNS, interconnect or Cloud VPN uh, for, for example, cloud to on-premises connectivity. Um, and then observability, audit logs, asset inventory, which gives you a nice overview of all assets um, used throughout your organization and security command center for post-mortem. Um, and another thing, of course, um, compliance requirements as your organization demands. Uh, least privilege principle is something that we always implemented. And yeah, depending on the kind of framework that we need to follow, the different guidelines, uh, SOC2, of course, uh, well applied and used in the US, um, CIS, etc. Um, in addition to that, what we kind, what we quite often see and use ourselves in the learning zone um, as additional components are things such as shared Kubernetes clusters, environmental clusters, for example, um, a cluster for production, a cluster for staging environments, and a cluster for ephemeral environments, so pre pre staging, dev sandbox environments, however you name them, and um, basically every single time we work on a learning zone projects are yeah artifact registries, cloud storage, etc. for storing and reusing assets that are shared among several environments. Demo. Okay, let's dive in. Um, let me open my IDE. Is that visible? Absolutely. Okay, so let me quickly see. Yes, yeah, so I'm using NeoVim and most of the time, I, the times my IDE is broken due to some <laughs> crazy uh, updates, but um, it should be okay today. Um, why do I use uh, NeoVim? Because I like Tmux and it's um, for me the best developer experience, although I know that most of you may use VS Code. Anyways, um, so here um, I basically created a very lean demo um, landing zone for ISCG Cloud. Again, if um, you would like to see this in action further, please ping me after this uh, after this talk. We can jump on a call. I can ex uh, explain you some more of those patterns. And at some point, um, I may open source this also, but for that, I need to write a little bit more documentation. And um, the idea is basically that, um, as mentioned previously, we split up our landing zone on the components used in the landing zone into different stacks. Uh, 
And on a stack level, we basically have organizations. So we could also manage multiple organizations here. Um, we could probably even manage multiple clouds um, by using different providers. At the moment, it's basically the um, only the Google Cloud provider they use and projects. Uh, and on an organizational level, what I wanted to elaborate on is a little bit. So we have landing zone here. This is an organizational landing zone, includes configurations for audit logs, essential contacts, um, ISC. What is ISC? ISC are basically service accounts in cloud storage buckets used for managing the different projects. So instead of having the service accounts and the um, state buckets deployed in the individual projects, we have a centralized project as a centralized project where we manage all those uh, things in that it's completely isolated from whatever other projects you may create. Uh, then again, as mentioned already, um, I am and Liens. Um, Liens are the uh, deletion protection. And I can basically um, show you how this looks like. Um, so here, Marius is my co-founder, by the way. Um, we're using Terramate. Um, Terramate has this concept of, of, of globals. Um, that is basically defining yeah, defining data that can be used by various templates. Um, the way that we do this here is that um, we assign always least privileged principle, means only the permissions needed for the different, yeah, for the different people in the organization. And we end up generating a bunch of Terraform code. Uh, this is basically um, generated code here. This is pure Terraform code that we can check into the repository. Um, to our landing zone repository um, without having Terramate installed. And um, I also wanted to show you how we do the Terraform backend uh, generation. This is quite neat because I think a lot of other tools are using the directory hierarchy for defining the stack, uh, the, the state file. We basically use a prefix here that has a UUID and that enables you to move stacks up and down the um, the directory hierarchy, um, hierarchy without um, yeah recreating stacks without changing um, the the um, the state. Yeah. Okay. So let me see. Um, I would like to create a project. Yeah. And again, the way that we do this is we kind of have, if you if you take a look here in modules, um, I can make this a little bit bigger. Um, we kind of have one module that um, we manage all the landing zone specific dependencies in. This is all based on a lot of different open source models. I think um, Mineros as an organization, we have more than... 80 open source modules in um yeah with this with a focus on Google Cloud. Um, and we basically use those to um, bundle resources um, together. So what would be an example, for example, cloud storage and cloud storage IAM. Uh, so instead of reusing single resources all the time, we have already built well-tested and documented modules um, that we just reuse here. And um, here we have a set different patterns. Um, we unfortunately have a little bit too too um, we have a little bit too short on time to really dive into this, um, and it's also rather complex. But um, if someone of you is interested in in knowing in detail again how we build this, I'm always happy to jump on a call or to even give uh, another webinar here that this may be a little bit more focused on the technology. Um, what I would like to do is basically I would like to create a project. Um, that um, we call, let's say, I, let me see if I created this already. No, that we just call Mineros um, Landing Zone Demo. Uh, so the way that we look at it is basically this is the organization, and um, this would be the department, uh, Landing Zone Team, and Demo is the environment. Let me do this. It's a bunch of stacks that are being created. Uh, and let me also show you how this works by looking at the project factory. So let me. So the project factory is basically responsible for creating and managing projects. And now you can see we have a new project here that has a lot of different stacks configured. Uh, and to show you this, um, SKO, um, let's say platform engineering demo. Uh, I just 
uh, I will just quickly um, push this and show you how this looks in Git. Let me see if everything is in here. Yes, feed, create new um, demo project in Google Cloud. Boom, boom. And then we open a pull request. Uh, let's say this is a draft. Um, this may take um, one or two minutes, but basically what you see I now does here, um, it basically detects that, hey, we want to create a new project. Um, we, need to we need to protect it for um, deletion. And as of this demo, the resources defined or the resources that I elaborated on in the presentation um, will be bundled in this project and uh, created all together. So that are a bunch of Terraform service, uh, Google service APIs to enable, basically, as you can see here, um, a Google project. Um, the provider definition, of course, the state backend, um, audit logs are disabled by default, but I will show you in a second how this looks like when we enable those. Um, we can override um, defaults that we set here for the um, for this project. So, for example, to just show you how this works, um, we actually show this to you here. This interface is a little bit nicer. Um, so here we kind of use a centralized configuration file that we set defaults for all projects used. Uh, so for example, this is a billing account. Can you zoom in a bit? Yeah, sure. Um, this is a billing account. And then the way that we use those uh, environments, a default region, default, a default um, provider version, et cetera, the way that we um, basically handle those is that we either use the defaults uh, or we overwrite them. Let me show this to you here on a case by case, uh, case basis. Uh, so now let's jump back. Hopefully the CI is not yet finished. Now it's finished. So the way, and this is again, um, Kind of a lean type of a lending zone that I yeah, use for ex explaining those concepts um, in also longer sessions. But we basically show in the CI pipelines, okay, what are the stacks? Yeah? What are the stacks in our Terraform and our infrastructure as code um, that have changed? And you can see here inside this directory project factory, um, we created a new directory called Mineros um, Lending Zone Demo, right? It's a project. And what are the associated resources, audit logs, essential contacts, the cloud storage. The cloud storage, though, will not be deployed, as mentioned before, in this project, but in a centralized project. Um, service accounts um, used for read-only operations, service accounts used for read-write operations. Then, of, of course, the service accounts only have the permissions applied that we need. So, for example, if you want to manage a Kubernetes cluster in this project, you need to enable the service. And you need to assign the necessary permissions in order to deploy and manage a cluster to the to the service account. You can, of course, just grant it owner, and you can also just um, create and uh, enable all services. Um, but we like to use um, the least yeah privileged principle, at least when it comes to IAM. Um, um, and then shared VPC could be either declared this project as a host VPC or as a client, as a host project or as a service project. Service project basically means it joins another project or it gets access to another project's VPCs. Um, then again, this is what I um, showed to you during the presentation. Um, we kind of put this, um, we kind of put the output um, to the comments, yeah, in order for teams basically to yeah give them an understanding of what actually happens. And this is nothing else but the raw Terraform plan. Yeah. This can also be visualized. Um, yeah, I can also use some emojis here also if you want to. I don't know. Um, but it's basically for teams to get a to, to get an overview. Um what's quite of interesting is um this part here. So um, we basically, or um, the way that I think about credentials is that, especially service accounts in Google Cloud, is that long-living credentials should always be prevented. So for everything that I do, I usually use OIDC. Um, um, so instead of 
for example, having user managed service account key files that I think um, have a long levity of 10 years or so in Google Cloud. Um, we use OIDC and we don't manage any service account keys anymore, um, which means basically for every request or for a bunch of requests, you create a short living token that you then use to authenticate and authorize with the Google Cloud organization. Um, it's an advanced but recommended pattern. And um, yeah, you can basically use um, most of major SaaS tools with that as it's supported. Um, then we have um, some IAM bindings here, um, et cetera. So basically, it's a very convenient and easy way for teams to create a new project. Uh, um, I can, of course, also put this in ready to review. Um, and now um, use my Supma admin powers and just merge this, which is, of course, bad. Someone should review this. And then um, we should see here the pipelines getting started. Organizational deployments is probably what we will want to look in. And uh, we can just watch the pipeline in a second how it applies the changes. Um, may take some time it's cute at the moment yeah but um here the idea is basically of course this is now a very mvp kind of version that you just create projects um i basically can do the same with folders um or all kinds of patterns in the landing zone um with a bash script yeah a more advanced pattern would be to um, have some kind of gui on top um that basically by uh, a single click um you orchestrate all those different commits so something that we did for um in one of the projects that we worked is again this is what i said early on in this webinar we try to always think in terms of workflows rather rather than technologies so we use isc um in some projects for basically managing a lot of different technologies, yeah, whether it's Google Cloud, whether it's Cloudflare for DNS, whether it's GitHub for repository uh, management, whether it's Kubernetes for namespace creation. And what you can do as an advanced pattern is build an orchestrator on top of this. Um, I've heard to Money Tech is quite a good platform to do so that um, uh, basically, yeah, just uses those different approaches to build a very easy and convenient to use API for developers. Uh, you may still want to use infrastructure as code because it provides you with, um, yeah, basically the, the the previous mentioned benefits. Yeah, but you don't really need to ask developers to to do this code generation or to even commit this code. Yeah, this can all be automated with bots. Um, whether you use something like Argo workflows or you use um, yeah a SaaS platform such as Humanitech for that. Um, I think as of the demo, um, we should uh, limit this here. Um, otherwise, um, we would probably run out of time. Again, I can only offer you um, to maybe come up um, with a second session um, at a later point of time. Or um, if for some of you is interest, uh, interest, we can also dive into individuals. I can also show you how I do similar patterns in um, AWS. I'm happy, always happy to have uh, to have. Just ping me in the community slack and and reach out yeah always happy to jump on a call as well um that's basically it 45 minutes on point so christoph uh, can't be too upset with thank me thank you sir um, and i'm never upset um thank you so much um you're welcome. it was good I, I would have tons of questions but let's maybe um turn to the audience for a second um we do have a number of questions um if you have more questions feel free to share them in the q a um i just start on 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 top by a number of um thumbs up so um mr or mrs kraus is asking why are stacks apparent above organizations it seems that business orgs would be the top grouping especially if your technology platform is multi-cloud uh, can you can you repeat the question so why are stacks apparent above organizations um why are stacks apparent above organizations so i see i believe you can still see my uh, mm -hmm. sorry, you can yep. still see my screen um sorry they are not so it's merely a naming thing yeah so what we say here is that the stacks and effectively projects and organization is just a directory that includes stacks and um, why do we separate this because things that you apply and that you manage on an organizational level are fundamentally very different than the infrastructure and cloud services that you configure inside of a project 
Ja? So the organization, what we do here is again, uh, I have organizations slash Mineros. This is not a stack yet. This is merely a directory tree. If I look inside folders, for example, this is also just a directory. Engineering is just a directory. Uh, engineering is a stack, sorry. So folders is a directory. Engineering is a stack. Uh, and then inside of the stack, we have different sub stacks. Uh, so for example, I am handled on a folder level, right? What I could do here is quite interesting. What we've built is that basically every folder has subfolders or has a project factory. So now if I move this newly created project, yeah, Mineros Landing Zone demo from basically Mineros.io project factory, uh, I believe it's here, um, up the uh, directory hierarchy to folders engineering project factory, it would automatically, that's something that we just built, so it's convenient, it would automatically move this project and associate this project to this specific folder called engineering. Uh, um, yes, I understand that this is probably rather complex as we, uh, in 45 minutes, we cannot really dive into the Terramate basics. But um, the point that I wanted to make here is that basically, instead of even reusing modules here all the time, we basically just write configurations. Uh, mm -hmm. um, this is what I showed you when I said like, hey, this config.tm file, which is also just in uh, .tm uh, .hcl file, sorry, um, HashiCorp configuration language um, file, is merely a configuration file that gets rendered uh, um, to, um, to Terraform code. So mm -hmm. even for the platform engineers in uh, or the cloud engineers in your organization, we already abstract this so they don't need to import modules all the time, reuse those. And just so we have this, have seen this for once, um, let's maybe look into something here. Um, the way that we do this, and it's quite neat, is basically by saying like, hey, in Terramate, we have something like, a generate HTL statement based on the condition, right? So in this case here, the example is an artifact registry. And I just say like, hey, whenever a stack is located in a directory called artifact registry repositories, repository name, um, it will just use this configuration file, aka globals, and set those globals in the associated modules. And instead of using a name, it would just use the, yeah, the name of this directory. So if I rename the directory, I automatically rename the artifact registry, which is quite neat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I hope that answers the question. Next question. I, I hope so too. Sure. Um, so you're basically saying the lending zone should drive the strategy and not the reverse is a question by Scott. Um, no, the landing zone should not drive the strategy. The strategy should clearly be defined first and the landing zone is the way of implementing the strategy. So first of all, I don't think it makes much sense for smaller organizations to implement um, a landing zone themselves. It may make sense if you work with a pre-configured solution or so, so you don't need to invest, let's say, 100,000 euros of engineering hours. But typically, the real benefits when using a landing zone, um, you will feel when you have lots of engineering teams and lots of different departments. Um, the governance, though, needs to be defined on a higher level. Yeah. So the way that you should work is to always first define and strategize on your cloud adoption strategy and then implement this as a landing zone, right? And this is exactly the kind of problem that we try to solve here because the way landing zones are designed is very different yeah, on a governmental a governance level, on a, a resource hierarchy level. It's very different from organization to organization, but the way that you actually implement the landing zone, AKA the technology that you use, that can be the same, right? It's mm. just a technology and you should not spend months and months of work and <clears throat> doing this from scratch. Mm. Okay. If that makes sense. Um, Martin is asking, how do you manage cost with shared resources? For example, Kubernetes clusters. Yes, that is a, a very interesting question that we see that we hear quite often. So if you the the very the very straightforward answer in um, Google Cloud, for example, would be cost metering in GKE. Yeah. So what you can do um, basically, if you let's say have a shared cluster that runs all the workloads in, yeah, workloads, aka um, pods required for your service, 
then of course, those are in a centralized project versus the backing infrastructure is probably moved in um, in a separate project. So the way that you typically do this, and then uh, feel free to also ping me on LinkedIn or whatnot later on. I can, I'm happy to jump on a 20 minutes call and show you a demo or show you in some examples on how we did that. But basically you, you use the cost metering API and GKE that gives you all the data at what point of time that you deploy which, which workload aka pods and then it's all about um, associating the right annotations and label in order to <clears throat> identify those and you correlate the data um, with basically whatever costs are produced in the projects that are managing and owning owning the um, backing infrastructure yeah? mm -hmm. and then you can use something like google data studio to visualize this um, or something more advanced like looker or so yeah mm -hmm. But effectively, so Google Cloud even has some um, examples on how to do this, um, but it will require you to do at least some amount of work. Yeah, it's not that complicated. Um, and I would say the most effort is more, again, on the organizational side, how and how do you use annotations? How do you take your workloads, et cetera? Yeah. Okay. Um, Daniel is asking, what tools and workflow are you using to automate the Terraform plan, Terraform apply on GitHub? Um, we, in this case, to automate the Terraform, I can basically also show you this. Um, we just use GitHub Actions here. Um, in this example, in, um, let's say um, the landing zone that we usually use at customer, um, we are using, I think it's it's cloud built in, in Google. Uh, I forgot the equi uh, equivalent uh, in AWS, to be honest, I forgot the name. Um, but as it already handles all the um, authentication, et cetera, but let's maybe look at one of those workflows here. So deploy projects, pretty straightforward. Um, basically, we just give it a matrix, a matrix of projects to be deployed. Um, we install Terramate as a binary, of course, so we don't need to compile it. Um, we run um, some yeah static code analysis, some some just some integrity checks, like it's the code for, probably formatted, and then we do nothing else but planning the changes, dumping them um, into a file. And those, those files we append as um, yeah as a comment to GitHub, to the GitHub pull request. And then in case you run the CI pipeline a second time, we just overwrite the old comment. Um, and here authentication is done. You can see this here with workload identity. Uh, and what's neat about workload identity is that you can basically limit the workload identity, mm -hmm. not only to the GitHub repository, but even to the work to the GitHub action workflow. Uh, um, if you want to take a look um, into this um, into these workflows, I'm more than happy to share them um, and make them open source even after yeah after the session. Cool. All right. Thanks. There was also a question on what is the um, what is the community Slack? Um, that's the Slack of the of the platform engineering uh, of platform engineering. So let me just share the link here again in the chat if you want to um, join. Um, another Daniel, I think, um, is asking, um, do you use just GitHub Action CI CD or Atlantis or Terraform Cloud or such? Um, so Atlantis we don't use. Um, or we, this the, I would say this is a decision that um, um, should be um, done by the individual engineering teams. We don't really care whether you want to use Terraform Cloud Enterprise whether you want to use Spacelift or Atlantis, Atlantis is a great product, by the way. Don't get me don't get me wrong. What I what I'm ref merely referring to is that you don't need to use it necessarily. Um, but this the um, those workflows or the workflows that we try to build are CI agnostic. So we mm -hmm. try to always integrate, and that's kind of also the beauty of uh, Terramate because again, Terramate does not necessarily need to be installed in your uh, CI. You can just you know use, for example, GitHub Actions to generate a code or even just generating the code um, locally. Um, I would like to show you an example, actually, but I think we're too short on time. So maybe um, we do this in a second session or so, how to generate the code. Um, and then use whatever CI platform of choice. Um, because, of course, GitHub, Action, Get, GitHub Actions is limited to the extent um, that when it comes to the functionality, so if you work in bigger teams, yeah, Terraform mm -hmm. Cloud is might be your tool of choice. Maybe it's Atlantis, maybe it's Spacelift, which is also great. It uh, depends, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it you, it should implement um, the code that you write should implement with all 
um, major platforms. Okay, we have one request to show your contact slide again, Zuren. So maybe yeah. you share your contact slide again. We'll also share that information in the yeah. follow-up email. But yes. um, cool. here's my contact slide and that picture <laughs> is 10 years old. Um, I, I, I didn't want to say it, but yeah, um, I, I can see a difference, uh, which is fine. Um, all right, cool. Um, I'd say one more question and then we um, we round this up. Um, so Daniel is asking, um, shared VPC exists in AWS, but uh, also it's also about sharing subnets. Probably yeah, you already that uh, uh, that that may be right. To be frank, I haven't worked in I haven't worked in AWS for quite some time, and uh, so the, the way that we work as a company is that. Um, I'm basically very Google Cloud centric and there's another team in the company that's very AWS centric. Um, thanks for the hint, very much appreciated. And uh, of course, uh, exactly right to, cor uh, yeah, to correct me here so the audience doesn't get any wrong information. Mm -hmm. So appreciate it. Um, as of the contacts, please ping me if possible on LinkedIn or via email. I'm not a big Twitter person. I just read the daily crypto disaster there, but um, a part of that um, best is to contact me via either email or LinkedIn. Thank you. All right, cool. Zuren, thank you so much um, for your second webinar. Um, let's see. I can already see a third webinar um, yeah, coming up. Um, I think diving a bit deeper into some of the technology aspects that you shared today. Um, thanks also everybody for joining um, today. Um, great to have you here. As I said, we'll share um, a, a, a recording of this presentation tomorrow. Um, maybe also the the slides, Florian, if you mind. Um, if yeah. You, if you, yeah. If we you will. share them with me, then I put them in the uh, follow up email. Um, thanks everybody. Have a great day or evening, um, where from wherever you joined, um, and see you hopefully uh, at the next meetup. Thank you so much, Christoph and Ravi. To answer your question, yes, we will also share the mirror board. Thank you, guys.